This is Michael Popak, and it's time for Legal AF After Dark. Judge Cannon is stacking up decisions and rulings and paperless orders and procedural missteps all along the way that seem all to be in favor of Donald Trump. Much to the consternation of the prosecutors, the special counsel, what are they going to do? Well, one of the things I think they're going to do is they're going to wait to see a major ruling in the next week or two involving the suppression of evidence, including the evidence seized at Mar-a-Lago, which is the very heart of the indictment. And as soon as those rulings go against the government and go against the U.S., you're going to see that appeal up to the 11th Circuit to try to finally reverse Aileen Cannon, the judge that is, and I use the term lightly, presiding over this case. We break it all down for you this week on Legal AF. Take a listen. Judge Eileen Cannon, not boom, 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 not that. Judge Eileen Cannon, not Cannonball. Um, So she issued a few orders this week. One of them was on the deadline for Donald Trump to disclose the expert witness in the Mar-a-Lago document case where the original deadline was November of 2023, and that date was then adjourned twice, and then the new date was June 10th. You disclose your expert in the case, expert deadline. On the day the expert disclosure was due, this is how the arrogance of Trump and Trump's lawyers and how they know cannons in the bag for her, right? A bag for them. Is that on the day the disclosure is due, Rather than disclosing the expert, they ask for an extension the day it's due. And then they say the reason why they need the extension in the filing, which is right there, you can read the filing for yourself, is they say that the expert they were going to hire told them over the weekend that that the expert can no longer be their expert. So then, uh, so they waited until the weekend, then the expert said, I can't be the expert, then on Monday, on the disclosure deadline when you're supposed to give a pretty detailed disclosure you go hey you know judge cannon we we need some more time any other federal judge would sanction you for that con for that type of conduct by the way she judge cannon had previously admonished special counsel jack smith for not meeting and conferring for a length of time that Judge Cannon and whatever arbitrary view she has was sufficient for her when Donald Trump was lying and saying that the FBI was trying to assassinate him and the DOJ wanted to kill him. Trump's just like lying about that, taking the standard use of force policy that exists in every search warrant and claiming that, oh, they're coming after me, they want to kill me. And Jack Smith met and conferred with Trump's lawyers. Trump's lawyers were like, uh, you know, because Jack Smith wanted to modify the conditions of Trump's release and basically have a gag order saying, stop lying about that. You're going to get DOJ and law enforcement killed. And Trump's lawyers were like, yeah, well, we don't want to meet and confer with you. Let, let's schedule it sometime next week. So Jack Smith filed with the court sufficiently after giving Trump's lawyers sufficient time to meet and confer. And, and, and when Jack Smith did it with sufficient time, Judge Cannon admonished him. And Judge Cannon goes, the court finds that special counsel's pro forma conferral to be wholly lacking in substance and professional courtesy. And she rejected his request for not being courteous enough after Donald Trump was about to get law enforcement killed while Jack Smith gave plenty of time. But Donald Trump, the day of the deadline, says, you know what, I need need some more time. Give us an extension. And then she goes out of her way and says, granting it for good cause. This was her order. The court finds that good cause exists for the extension request and that no prejudice to the special counsel or the proceeding will result from granting the relief sought. And then she says, moving forward, any requests or extensions or enlargement must be filed sufficiently in advance of the deadline at issue. So, hey, maybe in the future, Donald, you can just do it a little more in advance than like the day the disclosures were due, but but I got your back. That's the message that was sent there. The, the other thing that Judge Eileen Cannon did was while she denied a motion to dismiss filed by Donald Trump that frankly, I, I couldn't even comprehend what he was even saying the grounds for dismissal of the indictment were for, duplicative allegations and saying that 
It was too long. I, it, it literally made no sense, Donald Trump's motion. While she denied Donald Trump's motion to dismiss, she struck certain allegations in there that she said were too prejudicial to Donald Trump. And here's the allegations that she struck. In August or September 2021, when Donald Trump was no longer president, Trump met in his office at the Bedminster Club with a representative of his political action committee. During the meeting, Trump commented that an ongoing military operation in country B was not going well. Trump showed the PAC representative a classified map of country B and told the PAC representative that he should not be showing the map to the PAC representative and not to get too close. The PAC representative did not have a security clearance or any need to know classified information about the military operation. As George Conway says, it seems that in Judge Cannon's view, prejudicial means conclusively demonstrative of the defendant's criminal state of mind. He's absolutely right. That paragraph is clearly an important paragraph to go in the indictment. It shows Donald Trump's intent. If he's saying to someone, you shouldn't see these documents, it directly rebuts Donald Trump's other claim that he believes he was entitled to have them. It may be prejudicial to Donald Trump, but that's like saying all criminal complaints are prejudicial to the criminal because they talk about the criminal's crimes. So, Popak, that's what Judge Cannon did today. Um, it's I think Jack Smith was certainly looking into whether there could be an appeal of that. It's still not necessarily one of those finite topics where you can seek interlocutory review um, because it doesn't address a SEPA issue where you can have interlocutory review. There are a few other kind of finite areas where you can take the appeal midway through. But but I, I know on your hot take, you, you thought that there's a potential, at least, that Jack Smith could, um, mm -hmm. you know, could could appeal this. But um, anyway, that's 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 what she did. But I want to show the comparison because what I want to show is that if Judge Cannon was a stickler for her calendar, the way she's being with the DOJ, and she's hard on them all the time, and hey, it's a pro forma meet and confer. I want seven days, not three days. And that's who the judge is. Same way like an umpire in a baseball game, right? They establish a strike zone. And then if it's within the strike zone, you have a sense of, okay, this is at least the strike zone of where it is. But for Cannon, she truly just has one set of rules for the prosecutor and one set of rules for Donald Trump. And the set of rules for Donald Trump is whatever benefits you. And the set of rules for the prosecutor is, whatever hurts you. One final point before throwing it to you. Judge Cannon's reputation, though, outside of this case, is to always be unfair to the criminal defendant's lawyers and to always be favorable to the prosecutors, almost no matter what the circumstance. That was the only rep that I got on her from people who have appeared criminal defense lawyers who I know have appeared before. So she's adjusted the whole framing here as how can I help Donald Trump? And that's why I don't just want to like whine, oh, Judge Cannon's a bad judge. Blah, blah. I just want to show you, here's how she made an order here. Here's how she made an order there. It's the exact opposite order with a very similar set of facts. In fact, far more egregious facts when it comes to the fact that there's life or death of FBI agents caused by Donald Trump's behavior. Hope I'll give you the final one. I think I covered a lot of it. Well, I'm not going to cover that, but I'm going to cover something else that worries me about Kennan. On, on, I agree with you. Under 404B of the criminal rules, she should have allowed to stay in the indictment the allegation that you read out loud. Susie Wiles is the person that is mentioned there at the time. It was listed as a PAC representative. We know now it's Susie Wiles, who's sort of this dark figure that's always surrounding Donald Trump, does all of his political action. She was involved with other communication between the co-conspirators. She's going to be a witness in that prosecution, by the way, whether, she, whether the paragraph that references her is taken out or not. The judge seemed very concerned about, well, when the indictment may go back in writing to the future jury, and that, since it's not, an, it's an uncharged crime, I can't understand why it's included, to which Jay Bratt and others have said it's because it goes to 
intent and motive. This is the guy who said he magically declassified everything on the way out of the White House. Well, if he believed that, then why was he worried about showing Susie Wiles a document that he shouldn't show her? Don't get too close because it's classified. See, that's inconsistent. And that goes with willfulness and intent. I'm less concerned about that, although that's a terrible, that's a terrible decision. Maybe they can ask, even if they don't have an appeal as of right, they can ask the 11th Circuit to go up on that one. But the one, I think they're just waiting, Ben, and they're keeping their powder dry. Because the one that I'm worried about, and I did a hot take on, is the one about Evan Corcoran. Ev- the, it's going to be her overturning a decision well made by Judge Beryl Howell, the chief judge at the time of the D.C. Circuit Court, about Evan Corcoran, the lawyer for Donald Trump, having participated in a crime or fraud with Donald Trump, which stripped Donald Trump of his attorney-client privilege and forced Evan Corcoran, who was the main lawyer for all things Mar-a-Lago and the, and the uh, documents and the interactions with the government and his own client during the relevant time period. He took 50 pages of single space notes. I got to tell you, I've been doing this a long time. I've never taken, for a client that I trusted, 50 pages of single space notes, including my mental musings and really damning evidence against Donald Trump, such as Donald Trump directing Evan Corcoran to make classified documents poof. And I'm I, this is a, a bare paraphrase, poof, disappear from his collection before he turned it over to the federal government. So, and audio tapes, audio memo recordings that also this guy made, which you would never do normally, uh, in which he's also has damning observations about his client, Donald Trump. That has been turned over to the prosecutors. We reported on it a long time ago when there was, you know, it's all secret hearings, but we were able to glean what happened as Evan Corcoran was testifying to the grand jury, now stripped of attorney-client privilege and had to turn over all those documents. They have moved to suppress all of Evan Corcoran's notes and damning testimony and keep him off the stand in this case. And it is pending before Judge Cannon. It will be determined at one of these crazy hearings of hers in the next two or three weeks. If she has the temerity with her lack of experience, with. 10 trial days under her belt to overturn Beryl Howell, who's a 20-year a judge, a, a litigator before that, who's well-respected, shortlisted for the United States Supreme Court, overturns her judgment and finds as the trial judge that that should be suppressed, then we're off and running to the 11th Circuit because she's dead wrong and, she didn't, and, and she's overstepped her boundaries. That's the one I'm worried about. And that's the one that's coming up in this next round of of hearings that are stacking up. And and uh, I'll leave it on this. Now that now the only active case left of the four at the moment is Mar-a-Lago. He already got convicted of the 34 felony counts. New York is over, all is over except for the shouting at sentencing, right? Georgia is is currently stayed subject to a motion to dismiss the Fawdy Willis has filed in order to get the appeal of Donald Trump dismissed and get that case out of the mud. Uh, D.C. election interference, as we said earlier in the podcast today, is awaiting the decision apparently on the last day before they go on their, on, on the Republican side, they go on their junkets paid for by MAGA federalists and people lobbying them for decisions on the bench. The day they leave for that, that's the day next Thursday, probably we're going to get that decision when it's too late to do anything. The only case left, which means now Donald Trump's lawyers, fresh off their loss at the New York court, can just train their resources and attention on the on the friendly judge that they think at Mar-a-Lago. And they just keep hitting that button because good things happen for them in her courtroom. It's the only judge that they reliably and consistently can get a positive ruling because she has such a jaundiced view of the Department of Justice and is so negative about them, and much to the frustration and flummoxing of the, of the prosecutors. And I think they're just waiting for her to make whatever crazy ruling it's gonna be about Evan Corcoran's notes and suppression and ultimately the hearing, uh, which will probably be part and parcel or over a two-day period, the way she likes to do it in her courtroom, 
dragging everybody into Fort Pierce, is she's also going to rule about the suppression of the search warrant, which is the it, you if if the prosecution by her ruling were to lose the evidence that was seized in under the search warrant because they didn't keep the sanct allegedly keep the sanctity of each box in the exact order that it was in even though it was scanned and reviewed and inventoried and a magistrate already took a look at it for a short amount of time if she does any part of that we're off to the 11th circuit and maybe with her replacement it's a case where donald trump stole nuclear secrets i, I don't want to ever forget that he stole our nuclear secrets. He stole war plans. He stole real serious documents and data. And his claim in one of his motions is that it now belongs to him and it no longer belongs to the government of the United States because he claims that he telepathically declassified it no one knew about it, but he te telepathically did it. And he claims under the Presidential Records Act, it's now his personal stuff. So he claims that our nuclear codes are his personal property. Me, me, me. That American war plans are his personal property. Me, me, me. And that's the case that Judge Eileen Cannon is presiding over and doing all of these things. And so this show goes kind of full circle, if you will, where, you know, I say there's a lot I could predict, a lot I can think through different scenarios. But I, I just think the, 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 the saddest and most shocking part about this is on just some objective reality stuff. Nuclear records don't belong to. What are we? What are you talking about? How, how could that even be an argument? You're absolutely immune, like a king. What are you talking? Well, this is the United States of America. What are you talking about? You're. I mean, we we can do our deep dive statutory analysis like you and I do all the time, Popak. But I don't want that to shadow the or cover what the, some of these basic things this is the united states of america we don't have kings you don't get to steal our nuclear records war plans and nuclear codes do not become your personal property where you have your valet hiding the documents caught on surveillance footage it looks like a like a like a ace ventura parody of the guy hiding these things it's, what, what are, where are we what are we talking about Welcome back. We do the show on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube and then on audio podcast platforms of your choice. We call it Legal AF for the for a very good reason, and now you know why. On Wednesdays, I do the show with Karen Freeman at Gniffalo. On Saturdays, I do it with Ben Micellis. And then we do hot takes like this one, I don't know, about every hour on the Midas Touch Network, bringing you curated stories at the intersection of law and politics. The only way we know how to do it, straight. We don't blow smoke or sunshine. Nobody censors us on this network. You're helping us build the network. It's completely independent without outside investors. So we need your support. Free subscribe to the Midas Touch YouTube channel. Help them get to 3 million free subscribers before the November election. If you know about Legal AF, we thank you from the bottom of our heart for being here and uh, being part of our audience. Take the clip, send it off to people in your life and ask them to join us after they've taken a, uh, taken a watch or taken a listen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, here's your introduction to Legal AF. That was a clip. We curate the top five stories every week, twice a week. And we invite you to come along for the ride. So until my next hot take, until my next Legal AF, this is Michael Popov reporting. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.